afternoon and welcome along to The Pastor's Heart. My name is Dominic Steele and today in this special edition of The Pastor's Heart we are remembering Dr Billy Graham and with me is the former Archbishop of Sydney and uh, General Secretary of GAFCON Dr Peter Jensen. Hello Dominic and hello it's everyone who's uh, listening to us. It's very nice to have you with us t today and um, well I was thinking as I was asking you in to come and talk to us about Dr Graham that there's a sense that he, I think, would be thinking about that old hymn of May They Forget the Channel, Seeing Only, only him. him, that he'd want us to look past him to the Lord Jesus. Yeah, that's the thing that I've been trying to say in the uh, media today, uh, from outside ourselves. Um, really, yes, Billy Graham is a great man, and uh, we admire him, thank God for him. But really, his greatness is that he pointed to Jesus, mm -hmm. like John the Baptist, he pointed to the Lamb of God, mm -hmm. and that's his greatness. Mm. So take us back to 1959, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the lead up to the crusade and the, the politics and churches coming on board and all that kind of thing. But take us back to you as a teenager going along to Randwick Race Course in 1959. Well, if I'd done that, I'd be in the wrong place, of course, uh, <laughs> okay. because it was held uh, at the Sydney Showground. Right, okay. Uh, but, so, <laughs> the well-researched interview. I, I have never actually been inside Randwick Race Course uh, <laughs> because I'm a Protestant. Um, no, the 79 Crusade was held at Randwick. Right. Uh, <laughs> there we are. Uh, the, uh, well, 15 years old, we were bussed there. We'd heard about Billy. I mean, there'd been a lot of talk in the press mm -hmm. and big, big billboards mm. and this sort of stuff. Uh, so we'd heard about him, but really, and we heard about this business of going forward and the last thing on earth you would want to do or something like that. Uh, anyhow, uh, we were there. I can remember sitting on the grass area of the showground. Um, Dominic, I often say that one of the first things that struck me was how well everything was organised. Mm -hmm. I'd been used to church. Mm -hmm. uh, everything failed at church. <laughs> uh, all technology yeah. failed, mm -hmm. inevitably. You know, slideshows, they all failed. Here was something that actually worked. Mm -hmm. It was very well organised. Mm -hmm. That struck me. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, there were huge numbers of people struck me. Because if you go into a small church and you're going there and so forth and so on, you, you don't get the sense of how big the Christian movement is. Mm. Well for us all to be there. Wonderful. Mm. Uh, sitting on the grass, Mr. Graham stood and preached. And I think what I always want to say is that, yes, of course, he was a very striking looking man. He was a very able preacher. Um, his voice was a great asset to him, all those sort of things. And the technology was in place. No screens, of course, but mm. the technology was in place. But the strength of Mr. Graham's presentation and don't forget, you're looking at a long distance too. You're not, you're not up close there. But uh, the strength of his presentation was uh, simple. The Bible, the Bible says, mm -hmm. the Bible says. And for people like myself, and 75% and of the people there were uh, church people, mm -hmm. uh, to hear this is what the Bible says, spoken so strongly, powerfully and persuasively, uh, I think was crucial. It wasn't Billy himself, it was the fact that this is the Word of God, mm. which I think was decisive. Now we're taking questions on uh, Facebook Live. People are able to ask questions. We've got a question here from John Sandyman and he says, can you ask Peter what it felt like walking into the stadium and what you felt like walking out? Well, uh, walking in, um, not fear or anything like that, just a little bit of curiosity mm -hmm. really about what was going on. Never been in anything like this before. Uh, walking out, I okay, uh, a new person. Mm -hmm. uh, up till then, gone to church. Was yes. it first? I mean, did you go several times and then trust Christ, or was no. it first time? Yes, first time. Yes, mm -hmm. and. Uh, up till then, I'd been going to church and so forth and so on, but classically, I knew about the Lord but didn't know the Lord. I was conscious of sin but not of salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, like so many uh, teenagers, I would have drifted away. Mm -hmm. And my older brother uh, went to church as well, but he, he didn't finish up in church. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I would have drifted away. Mm. Uh, but y you, I came out of that, I, th I don't think it's any exaggeration to say a new person. Mm. settled, I now understood, uh, with a sense of excitement, I don't think joy is the right word, but ex a, a sense of excitement as well about what had God had opened up. I felt that I had been in the very presence of God himself and he touched me. Mm. So just 
bouncing from that to a comment or a question from uh, Alexander Permano, uh, and he's asked, um, in what way was his message and approach different from the majority of or at least Anglican churches of Sydney at that time? Um, and so, I, I mean, you talked about <laughs> the technology worked, but what about the content the of the technology message? Technology worked. <laughs> Yes, uh, well, don't forget, I was a 15-year-old. I'd only ever been to one church, mm. uh, so you can't say for sure. But uh, looking historically, looking at the evidence, uh, the thing you've got to recognise is there, was, there were two things in our churches. One was there was a hangover from the time in the 20s and 30s when Moore College had become somewhat liberal, mm -hmm. uh, dominated by Freemasonry, uh, and there was a style of preaching and a sort of a substance of preaching which was moralistic, uh, which wasn't certainly wasn't expository, uh, which was believing, but not committed. Not it didn't didn't invite that commitment. But then, uh, and this was quite prominent in Sydney, there were many many people who did preach the word of God. They were strongly, more so perhaps than we are. They were strongly evangelistic. And one of the great criticisms of uh, Sydney sermons in those days was that every sermon was evangelistic. Uh, but these particularly, uh, of course, the rectors of the parishes, these men were deeply evangelistic, mm -hmm. involved in evangelism in the parishes, involved through scripture union camps and all that sort of stuff, crusader union. Uh, they were committed to evangelism. And I think the Billy Graham phenomenon does not arise out of nothing. Mm -hmm. It arises out of a deep and powerful commitment to the gospel over mm, 20 years by then mm -hmm. or more. So let's go back to the lead up and um, there, there are things we can say about the lead up in terms of the great um, uh, of unity of the churches uh, yeah. that, um, that, that we've seen in, um, yeah. uh, but also yeah. a fervent commitment to prayer. Yes. Now, I, of course, again, uh, you're talking to me, but I was not conscious of mm. this. But when you read the records, and particularly I'm indebted to uh, Stuart Piggin, mm -hmm. who's done a lot of uh, research in this area. But when you read it, and I, I did talk to people afterwards when I understood more. Mm -hmm. So that uh, people used to say in the in the 68 crusade, we had all night prayer meetings that used to stop at 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And in the 59 crusade, we had evening prayer meetings that went all night. <laughs> they didn't, they just went. There was real a fervency and a pouring, there a, was. A, a, a begging for God to work by his spirit. I believe there was. I believe that's true. Uh, people longed for... Uh, if you like transformation revival, they longed for that, and there was a huge amount of prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you mentioned the churches, mm. and I think too one of the things that str struck you, uh, you uh, as a 15-year-old, I didn't know too much about the different churches, but it was clear that uh, the Salvos were there, mm -hmm. that the Methodists were there, the Presbyterians were there. The, 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 the you know the the Protestant churches had come together in an extraordinary way to make this happen, mm -hmm. and of course I love. Uh, those occasions like Katoomba and other mm -hmm. places like that when we're all there and we all recognize that we belong to the same family uh, and so I think that was that was quite powerful now there were critics there were those who stood off uh, there were those in the Anglican churches particularly out of Sydney that stood off and made very critical remarks mm -hmm. uh, but in Sydney and I guess in Melbourne as well uh, the vast majority of the Protestant churches uh, led by Archbishop Mole, who died not long before, but led by others from the uh, Evangelical Anglicans, mm -hmm. but led by senior Methodists as well, uh, they came together. Mm. Pretty impressive. The choir, the choir was made up of all these churches, and the <laughs> choir was, is, uh, it just symbolised what, what I'm talking about. Now, we've talked mainly, well, exclusively about 1959 so far. Yeah. How close to a revival was it? Uh, well, you need to read Stuart Piggin about that, and you can look it up on the put in Stuart Piggin and Billy Graham, and you'll find a long article mm -hmm. and a very, very good article by Stuart on this subject. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, Stuart's belief is that it could be described as a revival. Um, in a sense, it's a moot point, but uh, some of the features of revival, as he understands it, were there, uh, including, strangely, a, a decline in uh, apparent decline in crime, criminality. Mm -hmm a decline in uh, births out of wedlock and a decline in drunkenness. Mm. So interesting, it did impact. See, at the final crusade meeting, uh, 153,000 people in the Sydney showground and the Sydney cricket mm. ground. It's extraordinary. Uh, in a city of two million. Mm. Well, 
uh, can and you imagine? And broadcast nationally. And broadcast nationally. Now, I guess in, if Sydney is, what, 4.6 million today, so you could work out statistically how many people would have to be there to represent the same proportion. Mm. Well, it, you may or may not call it a revival, but it certainly shook the place. Mm. Mm. And talk to me about the impact on numbers in church, numbers at theological oh. college, those kind of things. Yeah, well, again, Stuart points out that there was an increase in numbers in church. From the very first week of the crusade, mm -hmm. people started going to church. Um, church going was fairly common in those days in any case, uh, but there was an increase in going. Um, uh, college, yes, uh, so many people were converted at the Billy Graham crusade and then turned up at more college and presumably other colleges. Uh, in the years following, in the immediate years following. Mm -hmm. And that went on for a decade because I turned up in 66, for example. Bruce Ballantyne, who was converted at the same time as me, same meeting, uh, he turned up in 67. Uh, uh, Christine Jensen, who went forward at the crusade just to show her commitment, she was already a Christian, she turned up at Deaconess House in 67. So, But uh, Paul Barnett uh, turned up in Moore College, I think, 61. Robert Banks in the same mm -hmm. time. So, you know, but they were accompanied by many, many others. Mm -hmm. So the colleges, now it's important to reckon, look, stand back, look, the 50s, a church going decade, a lot, lot of nominalism. Mm -hmm. Nominalism drops away in the 60s. Crucial yeah. decade in the 20th century, mm -hmm. spiritually speaking. But what we had, and it's not just the Graham Crusade, there's a number of other things here uh, as well, but th what the Graham Crusade gave us was so many not no longer nominal Christians, but deeply, thoroughly, outwardly, confessedly Christian people. Mm -hmm. And this, in a way, helped carry the gospel uh, into the next decades. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, the, you can never say it's one thing, but it had, a, it had a profound effect on our churches and on the gospel and on the ministry of the gospel here in this city, and I presume Melbourne and elsewhere, of course. Um, in the in the uh, decades that followed mm. until this present moment mm. here i am we've got a another question in this one from sandy grant and uh my little brother was converted the same day oh yeah he tell went forward the same day well, well, no he wasn't converted <laughs> tell us about this you know my little brother <laughs> yeah i know your little brother yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> um philip philip his name is uh philip was 13 yeah. i was 15 he was 13 and we went to the crusade he was sitting there just near me he understood that only alcoholics and uh, criminals went forward at yep. crusades that was his sort of vague idea and then he saw me go forward and he knew i wasn't either of those two things <laughs> so he got up and followed me he was the first person i ever led to christ <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? That's, that's my claim. <laughs> However, it wasn't true because he wasn't really, he didn't really come to know the Lord for another two or three weeks during the follow-up period. Right. Because after the crusade, of course, you received material from them and you did the follow-up and it was then that Philip really trusted Christ. Trusted Christ. Yeah. I remember I looked back and I saw him coming and I thought, you know, he's too young. He can't make a commitment like this. He's too young. Because <laughs> yeah. I was 15. That's right. In so, your wisdom. <laughs> in my wisdom. You're right. Yeah. Anyhow, I've been watching him ever since just to see just if it's... Just to check. <laughs> just to see if it's stuck. So far... How are you feeling about that? <laughs> so good. So far. Okay. I've got a question from um, Sandy Grant. Um, what made Billy Graham so effective? Um, and he, he's asking about things like his, co his consistent character preparation and training, the wide spectrum of churches. Well, what, I mean, obviously there was a work of God, but looking back, what made the difference? Uh, yes, it's a work of God. I mean, that's all you can say. It, I mean, fundamentally, and Sandy, of course, knows this above all, but, uh, you know, even Balaam's ass spoke. Mm. Uh, God can use uh, even, even, uh, even the high priest said mm. something that was true. Uh, about the death of Jesus. Um, however, at a, at a human level, uh, God chose to use a man who, as far as we can see and as far as we know, uh, lived a life of integrity. Mm -hmm. And that has never really been shaken. There have been critics, of course, uh, and things that you wish Billy hadn't done. Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly, of course. But, but integrity has been there, and that is so important. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things he did early on uh, in the uh, 50s was he insisted that his, pr his crusades be desegregated. There was to be no segregation mm. of black and white at his crusades. That was important. Um, I think he was manifestly a man of God. 
I think there's an interesting little phrase that was used of him, I believe, uh, by a communist newspaper in uh, New York that uh, was interviewed him and they said that he was arrogantly humble. And I've often smiled at that. I think that's a, that's a brilliant phrase from a complete idiot. Um, <laughs> a brilliant phrase from a complete idiot. Well, what the, what whoever said that didn't recognise, he recognised the humility of Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. But he mistook Billy's conviction about Jesus for arrogance. Mm. And that, I think, was the problem. Mm. So, but uh, the thing, going back to Sandy's question, one of the other things that modelled, it models for us is that he never, in a sense, lost the plot, as far as I know. It, if you're going to talk mm. to Billy Graham, you know that at some point or other, he'd come around to talking about the Lord Jesus mm. and the gospel. Mm. And I think his ministry, uh, which uh, was so widespread and so forth, owed a great deal to that. Mm. He really went to the centre of things again and again. Now, you can criticise. I mean, um, uh, people would criticise the way in which he drew in all denominations mm -hmm. pretty well without discrimination. I mean, and, and criticism actually on the Roman Catholic front. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, I don't know too much about this, but I think uh, there, were, there were times, say, when he'd bring in the Roman Catholic Church and then people who went forward would be uh, sent to, back to their own Roman Catholic Church. Uh, I think that earned some uh, criticism. Uh, and there are other... I mean, I was, I was surprised this morning seeing on social media that um, I, I saw a Roman Catholic um, bishop from America. We'll, we'll put it up on the screen. Yeah. But... Uh, he was um, paying tribute to Billy and, and very respectfully and clearly, but praying for the repose of his soul. Yeah. And so he, d he didn't have a confidence, uh, this bishop didn't no. have a confidence that Billy would be in heaven. No. And yet, um, what would be the reply that you'd give to that man? It, I mean, uh, yeah. It says it all, doesn't it? Uh, well, of course, <laughs> Billy Graham was a sinner like the rest of us. There are many things in his life of which he was ashamed and, re and, and regretted. His heart was wrong, uh, but he was trusting in the blood of Jesus. Hmm. And therefore, as far, humanly speaking, all we can say is that uh, we know he is with the Lord he loved. Hmm. Not because he loved the Lord, but because the Lord loved him hmm. and gave his life for him. That's all you can say. What inspiration? I've got a question here from Ed Soden. He's asking, uh, what inspiration can young pastors draw from the life of Billy Graham. Okay, Ed, are you ready? I'll tell you what Billy said. <laughs> this is very unfair to address myself to Ed like this. <laughs> yeah. or to anyone. So forgive me, forgive me. I'll no, tell you no, what Billy tell said. Tell, tell you something. Look down the camera and say, <laughs> send it straight to Ed. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you something he did say uh, that I heard many times. He said, I wish I had studied more. I think his own uh, basic training, mm -hmm. uh, which which uh, I think was at Wheaton, but I think he regretted not having a greater grounding mm -hmm. in the Bible at the level of his basic training. I, mm -hmm. think, I think he did regret that. Now, in a way, you could say, well, in God's providence, it kept it simple for him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah. he, he wasn't troubled by a number of the things that you might be troubled by. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, I think uh, he, I'm just repeating what he said. Um, he modelled for us, as I say, great integrity. He modelled sticking to, sticking to the subject of the Lord Jesus. Uh, he didn't miss... So many people, I fear, that when they're interviewed in the press and media and so forth and so on, they, they, they go off topic. And I think Billy never went off topic. He, mm. he knew what he was doing uh, at that level. He had a very extraordinary winsomeness about him. Um, but also, he brought... And I don't think we ought to be ashamed about this. He bought organisational skills, or he surrounded himself with an extraordinary team of people. Extraordinary team of people. And he bought organisational skills through them, perhaps, but he bought of a very high order. Mm -hmm. And he bought it to the service of the gospel. So what I experienced that day as a 15-year-old when I went in was the work, the countless hours of work done by experts in making sure that the arena was exactly the right place where there'd be no distractions. Now I have to say also, and Stuart Piggin makes this point, uh, that it wasn't manipulation. That's uh -huh. a different matter. It wasn't manipulation of a service. 
Mm -hmm. You see, people assumed that it was hypnosis. People assumed it was that sort of stuff. But no, it wasn't uh, endless singing of songs that went on and on and on and sort of made you dizzy with their spell. It wasn't uh, um, extraordinary miracles and all that sort of stuff. No, it wasn't either of those things. Mm. It was singing, Christian singing, mm. Christian fellowship, and it was the preaching of the Word of God undergirded by uh, organisational skill of a very high order. Mm. Mm. We've, uh, we've just got another one here from uh, John Geyer, and he's asking about big evangelistic rallies today. And um, uh, do you think that big evangelistic rallies still work and can be used in our context, or, um, or is there a new equivalent? Well, it reminds me uh, of um, Bishop Cameron, who once asked uh, one of the old clergy in the diocese who was in charge of Leichhardt Church when it was absolutely packed jammed mm -hmm. in uh, the 1920s. He mm -hmm. said, uh, Bishop Cameron said to this guy, what was your secret? And this guy said, we were better men than you. <laughs> so no, you guys Well, couldn't. there's an encouragement to the yeah. minister of like <laughs> You guys couldn't do this yeah. because you're not as good as we were. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, people, uh, listening into what people are saying, they're saying, no, the age of that is finished. It couldn't happen again. Uh, I'm not so sure about that, I have to say. Um, I don't think, I think a Billy probably, and Billy Graham probably comes up once a hundred years. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can plan for it. I don't think you can promote a person and make him such. But I do think there comes uh, a voice from God, so to speak, or one who brings the voice of God to us, uh, whose, whose preaching is so extraordinary that people will rally to hear him. And I don't know that those days are finished. Uh, though I do think that the advent of the extraordinary media possibilities that we have now uh, also give us lots and lots of other possibilities for sharing the gospel. Mm. But you can't invent Billy Graham, you can't sort of insist there's going to be another one, you can't replace him, but I wouldn't say it could not happen again. Mm. Let's, um, while I've got you um, for a couple of minutes, if I could just turn your attention to um, the GAFCON movement oh, yeah. and the, the, the state of the uh, Anglican Church internationally. Um, uh, a few people might not know what is GAFCON because you're the General Secretary. Yeah. yeah, I am and have the privilege to be. Uh, look, it arises out of the crisis in world Christianity at the moment, which is a crisis of authority, the authority of God's word and the difficulty we have of living in a world where uh, the intensely sexualized world we live in mm -hmm. from the 1960s onwards uh, and where the world has come into the church, where um, in our own Anglican Church, particularly in the United States of America, uh, the church there has embraced ways of life and patterns of life which I believe are condemned in the scriptures. Uh, and in particular, it has embraced uh, uh, homosexual marriage and such. Now, this has created a crisis. It had created a crisis about uh, 15 years ago. And uh, uh, in 2008, there was a meeting that we were all meant to go to and half of us decided not to go to that meeting because it would be to compromise. So we went to Jerusalem instead and GAFCON was born. So I've been General Secretary the last um, uh, 10 years. Uh, in that time, about 100,000 Anglicans left the Anglican Church in North America mm -hmm. out of about 700,000 mm -hmm. and set up a new church, Anglican Church of North America. And they said, well, who are we? And, and lots of the rest of the Anglican Church said, well, we believe in you. We're going to cut ourselves off from the original body and we believe in you. And that's caused something of a rift, of course, uh, caused by the foolishness, I think, of those who went and did things that were not true to the Bible. Mm -hmm. So time has rolled on. Uh, the, um, the main power of GAFCON is in the global south, in Africa, Asia, South America, and so forth and so on, but it's, uh, we're connected to it here. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've set up branches in New Zealand and the UK, in Australia, we've set up a branch. Uh, just against the day, if it ever happens, praise God it won't, pray God it won't, uh, when a church like ours might suddenly say, well, we're going to go down the wrong path here. Mm. Well, GAFCON stands to say, it's wrong. Don't do that. And it stands as a way of, of, of bringing fellowship in, bringing the sweetness and joy of fellowship in from overseas to help us to know we're not alone. We're not alone. I'm imagining 
because you've got this big conference coming up in yeah, the next couple of months. We have in June. In yeah. June. And one of the things about running a conference is people decide whether or not to go or not go. Uh, indeed. And so it forces the issue of am I with you or am I not with you? And yeah. so imagine people at the moment who have just kind of been drifting along and now deciding actually am I with, if you like, the, uh, well, the Orthodox Church which is compromised or am I actually going to stand with these guys who are standing for the faith of the apostles. Is, it, is that yeah. what's happening? Well, yes. Yes and no. I mean, some people can't come because they're too expensive. Because yeah. <laughs> there's a number of, or they're going to do something else. So I don't say people are in the wrong. But there is, as I said, an, an, American, uh, sorry, an African bishop said to me at one of these conferences, now we know we're not alone. Mm -hmm. And I think being in Jerusalem, just some people said, oh, you know, I, I'd like to come, but what is there for me to do? Uh, be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like the CMS summer school, you're there and mm. you meet people and your being there is really important. So being in Jerusalem is a way of saying we are with you. Mm. Look, we've got uh, 50 people coming from New Zealand. Things are difficult in New mm. Zealand, really difficult. The church could be divided on this. We have 50 people coming from Ireland. Things are difficult in Ireland and the church could be divided on this sort of thing. And we've, now we've got people watching around the world. Yeah. Um, what's how is GAFCON going in the UK? Well, <laughs> have you got an hour, an hour or so? Because <laughs> uh, English are more conservative in, in, in their demeanour, you know, and they don't want they to ruffle are. feathers. They and, are. Yeah. Yes, well, they've all got to live together on a very little bit of ground, and, and it makes them more, <laughs> more conservative. Uh, but what GAFCON did, I'll tell you what GAFCON did. It, it was aware that in the UK, as in all the Western nations, this problem is before us of biblical authority and people moving off in the wrong direction. So in Scotland, for example, speaking of the UK and Scotland, the church in Anglican Church in Scotland has now endorsed gay marriage and is having gay marriages in the church. Well, there's a number of the Scottish Episcopalians, as they're called, who say, uh, we can't be part of this. Mm. We want to be Anglicans. How can we be Anglicans and yet not part of this? And the answer is GAFCON. We stand with them. And what we did this year was remarkable. Uh, we've set up, we, GAFCON, have set up a missionary society in England. I think it's marvellous. Mm -hmm. uh, we've set up a missionary society, a church planting missionary society mm -hmm. in England called the Anglican Mission in England. And it's now planted uh, half a dozen churches or so. And we had an ordination recently of nine uh, pastors young ready man. to go yeah. into that. Yeah, young men. And we had a bishop because uh, a guy called Andy Lyons, who's half Scottish, half English, he supports Scotland in the rugby. Uh, Andy was consecrated recently by GAFCON people, including our own Archbishop, Archbishop Davies and two uh, other Australian, Australian bishops. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, uh, Richard and Gary, uh, they were there. They all consecrated him for work in England. Well, of course, he's not recognized by the Church of England. The Church of England is a bit upset about this, I guess. So what's, what's Archbishop Welby think? Well, Archbishop Welby is committed to uh, committed to the unity of the Church of England, and he's committed to the unity of the Anglican Communion. So he is working very, very hard indeed to bring people together, which is a laudable thing to do. Um, uh, he talks, however, in terms of what's called what he calls good disagreement. So that, in his view, I think, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but as I understand it, in his view, uh, uh, the issue at hand of, uh, we're talking here about sexuality, is not so important that it should divide us. Uh, I, ga I guess that he does not regard this as being a matter of spiritual life and death. Uh, and so therefore he wants to keep us together, whereas the GAFCON movement is saying, no, this is, this is a matter in which souls will be lost, mm -hmm. in which people are in huge danger of the loss of their souls. And unless we make a stand and say, the Bible is the Word of God. This is what the Word of God says. We will not have fellowship with you because we want you to come back. We want you to repent. We want you to give this up and turn back to what the Bible says. That's the GAFCON message. I think Archbishop Welby's message is, well, yes, we disagree. We disagree deeply, but nonetheless, we ought still to be able to get on. Uh, now, I disagree with him and he disagrees with me. So that's okay, but uh, well, what, what there we are. you can say it's okay, but actually, it isn't okay. Mm. In that heaven and hell hangs on it, doesn't it? In the end, I don't think it's okay. Yeah. No, I I do think it's I, I think it's wrong. It's a serious error. Otherwise, I wouldn't be spending all my time, effort, 
energies and money. Tr trying to persuade other people. Trying to get people to, to gather together with GAFCON, not as a division, not as a schism. GAFCON is still in the Anglican communion, uh, but as a way of saying, look, we can't have fellowship with you Scottish Episcopalians. We can't have fellowship with you while you do this. Repent. We're not giving you up, but we're saying, please, our message to you is we're going to have to stand back and summon you to repentance and to put yourself again under the Word of God. Hmm. Dr. Jensen, thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. It's been a real pleasure. Dr. Peter Jensen has been my guest on The Pastor's Heart. And uh, look, you could go to the gafcon.org website and check out more details there. And uh, I'll be back next Tuesday afternoon at 2. Our guest on The Pastor's Heart next week is uh, going to be Sandy Galea. And uh, Sandy is, uh, well, she's married to Ray Galea. Uh, together, they're looking after the Anglican Church at Rudy Hill. She's got a substantial ministry uh, separate to the Rudy Hill Church to do with children. Uh, she's led lots and lots of uh, people who found her super helpful in the area of children's ministry. We're going to be talking to her about how to help children deal with grief. And uh, we'll look forward to you being with us next Tuesday afternoon at two on The Pastor's Heart. Thanks. Should be great. It'll be great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Peter. Cheers. Good.